A lot has been talked about in terms of opportunities around the Indigenization and Economic Empowerment Act. But my guest tonight believes nobody is going to knock on your door and tell you here is an opportunity. You've got to open your eyes and make sure you pursue those opportunities. My guest also believes not everybody should be accessing those opportunities. Others are meant to be employees, others are meant to be employers. Everything right here on Talking Business tonight. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Super Mandu and Zira, my guest tonight. Let me say welcome to Talking Business to some of you know her, Gloria Ndoro Mukombachoto. She is an international uh, private sector development consultant, has been working in many parts of uh, the world. Uh, I wanted to say Africa, but you've also been working in Afghanistan and many other places. Great pleasure to have you on Talking Business. Thank you. And we, we, we're going to talk basically about empowerment here. I want to focus on uh, uh, your work and also uh, what you think about empowerment for, for women who in many respects have been marginalized. But first, let's talk about the whole uh, indigenization and empowerment drive that's taking place in the country. What are your thoughts? I think uh, it's very exciting. Uh, it's not uh, necessarily a new intervention. It started many years ago. I believe uh, it started uh, soon after independence uh, because if you notice, government set up all kinds of, um, they repealed a lot of the um, laws that were excluding, previously excluding uh, black people. And uh, essentially, uh, government, I believe, even up until today, had set up a great uh, enabling environment for Zimbabweans, both men and women. To, to be masters and mistresses of their own destiny. So I'm very excited about the, the re-emergence of this debate and um, the setting up of the Indigenization and Empowerment Board. But, but when you say that it was done uh, uh, even immediately after independence, how much there hasn't, there hasn't been much results or you know, real progress or success to show for the empowerment of the indigenous people that, that we would then have to uh, get onto this initiative with the aggression that it is taking at the moment? I believe that um, it might be incorrect for us to say there hasn't been uh, progress. I believe that there has been progress to a certain extent. We might not have the empirical evidence to show mm -hmm. where black people or other groups who were uh, previously excluded um, before 1980 are participating but if studies were to be done uh, in the 13 industrial classifications of Zimbabwe, you would find participation of black people in those sectors. Whether that participation is sufficient or not is a question which I believe the current debate around indigenization and empowerment is trying to address. Okay, you, you've been uh, uh, in South Africa and many other uh, parts of the world, mm -hmm. uh, particularly consulting on international private sector development. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of comments about uh, the, uh, this process taking place in Zimbabwe, criticism in some quarters saying, look at what everyone else is doing, they're not doing what Zimbabweans are doing. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Is that a correct perception that uh, what we are doing has not been done elsewhere? You can never have a right way of doing this particular type of initiative because essentially um, perhaps let's move backwards and look at what does it mean to indigenize an economy mm -hmm. and what is empowerment. I'll start with indigenization. I believe that indigenization is the increasing of participation of previously excluded people uh, in certain sectors or all sectors of the economy. Here, we are looking in at 13 industrial classifications. If we look at mining, we need to say, where are the blacks participating? Okay, there are other groups who were previously excluded, like the Chinese. Um, I consider colored people to be black people. Mm -hmm. The Indians were also excluded. They were marginalized, perhaps not to the extent as black people. So those are other conversations that are going to take place. So the issue is in mining, for example. Uh, to what extent are blacks participating currently? To, where do we want that situation to get? 
clothing and textiles, what has happened? Uh, why are they not participating? Is it because uh, the Chinese are coming in with um, cheap inputs and so forth and so on? We need to look at that. Uh, look at other sectors, agriculture. Um, there was a land reform program, people accessed land. Uh, the majority of people right now with land uh, in agriculture are black people. But what is happening? Are there barriers to entry? Is there no access to financing and so forth? So I believe that you have to start somewhere and then make up the rules as you go along. When you are trying to create a level playing field in any society, uh, there is no right way of doing it. For example, if you take the whole issue of land that happened over the past few years, nowhere in the world, if you were to go and dig up in the archives, nowhere in the world, in the past, when land was taken by one group of people and being passed on to the other, was it ever done in an orderly manner? So when people are talking about order in right way, I would like to see an example in the world where it happened in an orderly manner. Perhaps Mauritius okay, uh, but has but come up with a model, okay. but uh, I believe that you have to start somewhere and then you know, make corrective measures and make up some of the rules as you go along. But if you speak to industrialists, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of them are from uh, the Confederation of Zimbabwe Industries, Zimbabwe National Chamber of Commerce, they will tell you, yes, nobody will ever argue with the whole uh, 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 principle of indigenization. It is the timing of it. You're scaring away investors. Which investors are we talking about here, Supa? The most important investors in Zimbabwe are the local investors. And first and foremost, the government of Zimbabwe need to create an enabling environment for the local people to invest in their own country. Uh, we can talk about foreign investors. Yes, their capital is welcome. But first and foremost, all rules and regulations must be to allow us, me and you, to participate in our economy. So if industrialists who are key stakeholders in this country are sitting outside of this process and criticizing it when they are key stakeholders then there is a problem because i believe that these are some of the um, primary stakeholders that government would have consulted in coming up with the new regulations that are now very topical gloria andorum kombachoto she is an international private sector development consultant has worked here in zimbabwe in south africa in afghanistan and many other places setting up enterprises there, or at least creating, uh, helping governments create an environment to uh, uh, sustain uh, entrepreneurship. She's my guest tonight on Talking Business. Don't go away. Lots to discuss, and we'll be right back. Hello and welcome back everyone. My name is Super Mandiwanzira. My guest tonight, Gloria Andorum Kombachoto. Some of you know her and uh, she has worked here. Uh, in fact, you worked here uh, as a consultant for the setting up of uh, the Oma Bank, which yes. was really a bank that was uh, designed to, tell us more about it, designed to promote women? It was a bank that had been supposed to be owned by women, uh, but also then um, favor women in terms of um, disbursement of loans. And uh, at some point, uh, the women's organizations and the then Ministry of Women's Affairs um, failed to take it to another level. It was an excellent concept because it's a concept that was going to work uh, through the Post Office Savings Bank in terms of co collecting money for the co capitalization of the bank. And then women were supposed to have been allocated shares meaning the, uh, uh, implying that it would have been a broad-based uh, shareholding of that bank, OMA, OMA Bank, meaning OMA, Ama Madzimai. That was the acronym. So what, what went wrong? I mean, you, 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 were, you, I you was played a, a key role. You I were, played a key role. I was a consultant. I had been hired by the Women's Affairs and being paid by the United Nations, uh, did the feasibility study, handed it over to the uh, stakeholders, and uh, the rest is history. I don't know what happened, really. But from your own uh, feasibility study, was this going to be feasible? It was an excellent idea, and it was a feasible idea. But uh, the, the people needed to speak with one voice. They needed to have a shared vision and shared values. And I believe that um, if I can only speak for myself, 
uh, the promoters of, of the venture did not have a shared vision or shared values. It did happen. What would be the situation today in your view? To tell for you women. the truth, yeah. for women, yeah. uh, we would have been uh, some of the most empowered women um, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we would have been a lot of women. Uh, the, the way the bank was going to operate would have been like the standard banks of the world. You know, uh, when you look at the standard bank strategy, um, it targets oh, uh, the lower income, middle and higher income. Uh, it's not a niche bank. And that was going to be the strategy of the Oma Bank. And we would have managed to penetrate not only in the major cities of Zimbabwe, but also in the rural areas. And um, there was capability that time. We had a lot of women bankers who were promoting it. And some of them have since left the country. But, so but could we, we, could we pull it off? Could we pull, pull off the feasibility study and uh, dust it up and uh, see whether it so. can be done? <laughs> I believe so. I think it's still within the archives of the Ministry of Women's Affairs. And I believe that there is still institutional memory there. There are some people who used to be with Women's Affairs who are still there today who know what happened. And I believe that it's something that can be put on the table and taken forward. Okay, talking about women and ordinary uh, Zimbabweans, this, this whole thrust towards indigenization and empowerment, most say, you know, how are you going to ensure that um, the ordinary people actually do benefit from this process? And you've been working and consulting on some of these issues. What are your views? Uh, first, I would like to know from you, what do you consider ordinary? Who is ordinary in Zimbabwe? I, I, I actually don't know the people when they say, are the ordinary going to benefit? But I would assume it is your average Zimbabwean who is in a rural area or is in a high density area, who probably doesn't have as much access to information as some of us do. Let me tell you something. Um, I think when these conversations are being spoken, wherever they are being spoken, uh, there is a lot of concealment of the truth. As you know, in any conversation that takes place, there is a certain degree of concealment and there is a certain degree of disclosure. And I would like to say that in many of these conversations around indigenization and empowerment, a lot of concealment is taking place. When you look at the structure of money in the world, not only in Zimbabwe, the structure of money is like a pyramid. If we were all meant to have money at certain levels in the world, this world we are living in would be a totally different manner. Zimbabwe is not any different. For you to be able to benefit from this initiative, you need to be not only empowered, but you need to have demonstrated obviously that you are worthy of benefiting. Look at what happened with the land reform program. Most people, many people I know, went and benefited from the land reform program. Right now, we've got a crisis in agriculture where it's very difficult to get employees because everybody has got their own piece of land. Who is going to work for other people if everybody owns land? So I think this is the same thing here. We need a screening process where we need to assess who you are, what have you done, um, what qualifies you to be participating at particular levels, be it in mining, be it in um, 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 agriculture, be it in clothing and textiles, and so many other sectors. What is your track record? There is a reason why when people go to banks, they look for the three Cs. Mm -hmm. Of course, one of them is security and um, your own contribution. We will put that aside because again, we are recognizing the fact that previously people were excluded. But what is your capability? And what is your capability, your capability as a human being? And most importantly, your credibility. Financial institutions, when people go to banks, they believe that financial institutions are selling check accounts and savings accounts and investments accounts. No, they are selling the intangibles. They are selling trust, they are selling honesty, they are selling credibility. Those things are also very important in this new initiative of indigenization and empowerment. To what extent can you demonstrate that you are a responsible person? 
And I'm not only talking about material responsibility, where you can demonstrate that you've got a house in Borodell, you've got five cars, your kids are going to private schools. No, I'm talking about a mother who is demonstrating that she has, uh, she's got a store at a market in Musika, in Bare Musika. She is a widow. She has got 10 kids, seven of whom she has uh, sent through to school by selling tomatoes. She is able to pay her rent if she doesn't own the house and so forth and so on. Those are issues we should be looking at. We cannot just take people from the streets who have chosen to take the law road and um, uh, mill around in the streets thinking that there is a deal that can happen tomorrow and make money overnight. The indigenization we are talking about is uh, participating in the economy for the long haul. It's not short-term deals. It's not No, we are talking about people who are willing to make sacrifices. And obviously, those who qualify will benefit. But again, people mustn't wait for government to bring the opportunities to them. People must go out there and scout for opportunities and present them to uh, the board, uh, be it the Indigenization and Empowerment Board. I understand that there is a fund that's going to be set up. There are proposals that are either going through the board or the ministry. That's where empowerment comes in. Okay, we're going to come back to that when we come back from the break. My name is uh, Superman Duanzira. My guest is Gloria Ndoro Mukomba Choto. We're talking about issues of empowerment and indigenization. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. We're in the last segment of Talk and Business tonight. If you're just joining us, I'm sorry, you missed uh, some uh, insights into the issue of empowerment and indigenization from Gloria Ndorum Kombachoto. She's my guest tonight. She's an international private sector development consultant, worked uh, throughout the world, including in Afghanistan. What were you doing in Afghanistan? I was um, making recommendations for the um, development of four companies that were being assisted by the Italian Corporation. But I went in through the United Nations because the Italians and the United Nations have got an, an agreement. Mm -hmm. So I was assisting the, I was doing an impact assessment actually on the four companies to see whether they should be shut down. Uh, the Italians, should they put in more money? And if they are going to put in more money in which particular companies and so forth and so on. What is the level of entrepreneurship there in Afghanistan? It's, it's very high, but uh, it's a country where people are, predominantly, are operating predominantly in the informal sector. Mm -hmm. So it was very exciting for me to see four women's companies that were thriving and in non-traditional businesses. I mean, women were producing jewelry, they were uh, fixing cell phones, repairing cell phones, uh, and all kinds of things. So it was very exciting, but as you know, uh, given the uh, country, the war, the war mm. is real, and uh, the, the, there are traditional and cultural and religious practices. Mm. Women tend to, to operate mainly uh, within the domestic environment. Yeah, you spoke about the informal sector there. Mm. Isn't the, the same situation we have in Zimbabwe that pretty much the bulk of the business, the bulk of the turnover of the country is actually in the informal sector than in the, the corporate sector? Well, this is what has happened. 